Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for the Annex 9 webinar series. Happy spring to everybody. I see that people are coming on board. Um, maybe we'll, we'll wait a couple of seconds uh, longer to welcome a few more people. Okay, uh, I think we should just get started. Good morning, everybody, again. My name is Shafina Qasim, and I'm the Canadian co-chair of the Climate Change Impacts Annex uh, of, the, of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. I'm very pleased to be here with you and with my colleague today, Jennifer Day, who's my U.S. co-chair for Annex 9. Um, today, we are pleased to be hosting the seventh in our webinar series of Annex 9 um, on Chicago's Climate Action Plan. So I'll pass it over to Jennifer now to walk us through some webinar logistics before we get started. Uh, thanks, Shafina, and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Jennifer Day, and I'm the US co-chair for Annex 9, and I'm from NOAA. Uh, just a few housekeeping items and reminders. Everyone has been muted for this webinar. However, if you have questions, please put them in the question box, which is found on the right-hand dashboard. And we will either answer them in the question box, depending on the nature of the questions, or we'll read them aloud during the question period um, so that we can get a good answer to that from our um, presenters today. Um, I also encourage you all to put in your questions in the box when you have them and when you're starting to think about them, uh, because we may be breaking between sections of the webinar and we will address a few questions um, as they come up at that time. Um, also, um, our quarterly webinars uh, take place in two parts. So the first hour, uh, we're pleased to be hosting our seventh educational webinar um, on the Climate Action Plan for the Chicago region. And uh, we'll be hearing from Dr. Ned Gardner and from Edith Makra today um, about their leadership of this effort, um, which is one of the first regional climate plans in the US. And I'm really excited about this presentation and all that you'll learn from it. Um, during the second hour from noon until 1 Eastern time, uh, we encourage everyone to stay on the line for our Annex 9 quarterly business call. On these calls, we will discuss, or on this call especially, we'll discuss the update from Annex 9, um, upgrade, up, update all of you on upcoming events and webinars of interest, um, all the different activities that we're currently working on, and most importantly, we're really interested in getting your feedback um, on our products, um, what we're working on, um, a few other things um, in this triennial year for the water quality agreement. And, uh, um, and we really rely on this extended group to help us um, continue our progress forward um, under the water quality agreement. Um, so uh, this is also a really good opportunity for many of uh, the folks out there um, to promote their recent research, any of their publications and events. So with that being said, it is my pleasure to introduce you all to today's speakers. Uh, first, we have Dr. Ned Gardner. Dr. Gardner leads the climate resilience engagement efforts on behalf of the US Climate Resilience Toolkit team from NOAA's Climate Program Office. The Climate Resilience Toolkit is a compendium of federal data, tools, reports, and expertise designed to help state and local governments understand and adapt to climate change. He has 25 years of experience as a science translator, um, bringing relevant earth si um, system science to decision makers. His interdisciplinary research in ecology and evolution, um, large data processing and visualization, multimedia production, designing and delivering public events through networks of large museums. I love that, by the way, Ned. Um, and uh, building federal government websites and programs to allow them to deliver, to deliver trusted science in a variety of contexts within the, uh, with his authentic understanding of both the source information and the needs of his audience. Dr. Gardner holds a BA in anthropology and, and environmental studies from Yale um, and both an MA in geography and a doctorate in ecology from the University of Georgia. And we also have Edith Macro with us today. Edith directs sustainability, um, the sustainability initiative for the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus. 
uh, which is a coalition of 275 mayors in the greater Chicago region. She leads programs to advance sustainability and environmental stewardship for municipalities. And she developed the Greenest Region Compact, uh, which is a consensus sustainability pledge that's now been adopted by 141 Chicago area communities and forming the largest regional municipal sustainability collaborative in the US. And now she's led the creation of the first climate action plan for the Chicago region. Uh, she previously served as the first environmental advisor to Chicago Mayor Richard M. Daley and has directed statewide and regional environmental programs in Illinois and Massachusetts. She has her bachelor's uh, in forestry from the University of Illinois and in an executive sustainability certificate from Harvard. She is also an International Society of Sustainability Professionals Sustainability Excellent Professional. So with that being said, um, very impressive bios. Um, I welcome Ned and Edith and uh, Ed, I, or Ned, I will make you the presenter. All right. And Shafina, you and I can probably go off camera now. Edith, I'll just hand it straight off to you. Okay, and I don't have controls right, so I am asking, uh, you're moving the slides? Correct. Okay. Yes, if you'd like yeah, yeah. control. That's great. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try not to be obnoxious with the next slide, please. <laughs> so, Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us, and thank you for your interest in um, our work in the Chicago uh, the Climate Action Plan for the Chicago region. Um, we're really proud to partner with NOAA uh, on this, and I would say the plan would not have been possible uh, without the collaboration and support of, of NOAA, and particularly uh, NED. So, uh, next slide. So the presentation, um, we'll go over the background and context, um, how and why we did the, the climate action plan. And then I'll talk um, about goals, targets, and objectives. I'll handle the mitigation side. Uh, Ned will go into a little bit more detail on the adaptation side. And we'll give examples of a couple of strategies. And then um, I'll talk about how we're engaging with our municipalities, taking it from a regional level to a local level. Um, and how this is designed to and how it's uh, starting to support municipalities. And then finally, I'll conclude with talking about how we, um, we are planning to integrate the Greenest Region Compact, which is the existing sustainability pledge with this new uh, Climate Action Plan. The Climate Action Plan uh, was just launched in July of last year, so quite new. Next slide. So um, the Greenest Region Compact, as Jennifer mentioned, this really became the foundation for our climate action. And it's also a good, um, it give, will give you some insight into how we approach working with municipalities and how the climate action plan is designed um, and targeted. So this will this make a little bit more sense going forward. Um, across our region, so we have 275 municipal members, including City of Chicago, um, most of our communities are small suburban communities, and most do not have capacity on sustainability. Um, at the time of the, uh, the Climate Action Plan launch, we only had three uh, local climate action plans for, the, uh, for any of the municipalities in the Chicago region. So um, the Greenest Region Compact and the Climate Action Plan are designed to provide resources and support and bring unity to the communities in our region. And so um, now these will animate through. So if you want to go to the next one, the Greenest Region Compact um, comes in three parts. And first off is a, a compact, which is a pledge, the political part, if you will, which has 49 sustainability goals. And we ask municipalities to formally support that going through the village board or city council. Next is a Greenest Region Compact framework, which is a very simple spreadsheet format um, menu and uh, menu of st uh, sustainability strategies and a tool for self-assessment and planning that many municipalities use to create their own sustainability plan. And then finally, we it's a tool for collaboration and having a collaboration to achieve goals. So we work on a lot of projects together, um, but having 141 municipalities, it was a little bit less at the time we asked for assistance on the climate action plan, making a formal statement saying that they're committed to climate action 
um, and wanting to work on these helped us leverage support that we got to do the climate action plan. So that's the foundation there. And then if you see the little green box, we also have counties and councils of governments, the mayor's caucus as an umbrella council of governments um, to sub-regional COGS uh, in the Chicago region. So next slide. And having this foundation and this strong coalition of communities ready for climate action, there was also an underlying little bit of um, what about us too <laughs> attitude when, we, uh, when I was seeking assistance in the climate action plan. Um, climate action planning really is the domain of large cities. Uh, a lot of philanthropy, technical assistance is being directed at the large cities. Well, the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy um, it, which is co-funded by the European Union and uh, philanthropists, including Bloomberg, was having luck across the globe, uh, particularly in Europe with regional scale planning. And that was of great interest to us. We happen to be of great interest to the global covenant of mayors. And if you look at the world map, the green dots are cities that are involved in global covenants of mayors, and yellow is the regions. Um, and in the US, there were no regions. So the pilot project that we were, um, we applied for and were selected as one of four regions in the US, uh, was designed to provide technical assistance and mentorship, that means no funding, but a lot of uh, support and assistance from the Global Covenant of Mayors. And there are four regions, um, you can see them on the map there. I will say that we're the third and final to finish, so one of the groups was not able to, uh, to finish in the time. But this was pioneering, it was incredibly useful for both the Mayors Caucus and our communities, as well as to this uh, global coalition. So next slide. And working with our, um, and the reason for a municipal, um, and the reason that they're interested in municipal involvement and uh, we understand, we as cities uh, really understand our roles in connecting for global climate impact. Um, in 2016, when our political leadership at the federal level changed, there was increasing focus on a greater stability and commitment from local government. And we accepted that challenge and knew that. We also know if you look at the, the very top of this diagram, we're closest at the local level to our constituents. And so when it comes to citizen engagement and empowerment and really understanding how to get things done, there's a unique power at the local level. And then of course, stepping up one level, if we can bring local governments and their constituents together at the regional level, we look then to have influence across the state across the US and then aiming for global impact as well. Next slide. So to get this project done, um, we had uh, a plan for stakeholder engagement, which is really important in any uh, climate action planning process. Um, and I will say the key partners on this one, so the Mayor's Caucus is a not-for-profit regional council of governments. We um, had to partner right away with our Metropolitan Planning Organization, which is the Chicago Age Metropolitan Agency for Planning, uh, which is this, has the same boundaries as we do and is a resource for data research um, staff capacity. So they were incredible partners from the get-go. Um, and it was shortly after we launched the project, uh, really focusing on mitigation in the very beginning um, and feeling a real inadequacy on the an adaptation side um, that I had the pleasure of meeting Ned and uh, hearing a presentation on the Climate Resilience Toolkit and the Steps to Resilience. A couple of months after our launch that um, Noah and Ned uh, agreed to provide really invaluable support, support for getting this project um, through to the finish line. And so the engagement process, we're really happy with the partners that we had and again, could not have done it uh, without them. Um, the stakeholder engagement process began in um, October of 2019. So we had an opportunity for three in-person workshops. Um, and then of course things changed in 2020 and we, we had to pivot to an online format. Um, and in this, the early stages of the pandemic, as everyone knows, there was you know, some learning processes for engagement, but we feel really good about the fact that we had um, a strong involvement from stakeholder partner organizations. And I wanna point out two important numbers if you look at that bulleted list of, of uh, partners that we had, we had 53 municipalities engaged, which is a, a good number, we're happy with that. Um, again, considering where the world was at that time, but if you, I always point out the number of organizations that are not municipalities, 
So what that says to us and what we felt as we were doing this was there was incredibly strong support that really wanted municipalities and our coalition of municipalities to succeed. So that's how I interpret that, uh, that number. Um, we also did a lot of uh, literature review, um, studied the existing sustainability and climate action plans, uh, both locally amongst our, our region, across the US and globally. Uh, so we put together a database of climate action plans and sustainability plans uh, that we used as a foundation to, uh, to build our own climate action plan. Next slide, please. So the output um, of the plan then is uh, the climate action plan has three primary components. And first to describe the, the uh, image that you're looking at is the mitigation addresses the greenhouse gas emissions and looking at taking actions to um, halt uh, and drive down um, the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The the line that you the dash line that you see in the center is uh, the the year of the climate action plan. So we see emissions rising over time. Plan is meant to address that, but we've had a lot of um, lay people particularly ask why does that blue why does the greenhouse gas emissions continue and of course the next part of the plan is the adaptation plan which just means that with the concentration of emissions we're going to be continuing to deal with uh, climate change impacts for a very long time and then the most important component really of the climate action plan is that it's rooted in equity um, and the of course the most vulnerable populations are going to be um, impacted first and worst by climate change, but also um, the a major shift in how we approach things and how we do things also gives us an opportunity to address historic inequities. And so there's, there's great opportunities as we undertake these strategies uh, to really try to build a more equitable uh, region. And on the mitigation side, particularly looking at investments from clean energy. Next slide, please. And so the, the plan is a climate action plan for the region. And I'll talk a little bit about the nuances here. So it is uh, the foundation of the plan um, is based on two uh, major sets of regional data. And the first one is looking at greenhouse gas emissions across the region. And we were fortunate that with the time frame that we have, and I should have mentioned this project was done in 16 months is the time frame that we had for it. Um, we already had a greenhouse gas emissions inventory that was conducted by our Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning at the regional level. And so um, the data, this, this data is from 2015, is the, uh, on which we based our, our actions and, and input it into models that we used. But for the Chicago metro region, the, the highest source of emissions comes from our stationary um, energy by a great amount. And if you look at nationally in the US, it's usually transportation is the highest um, emissions source, but for us, it's stationary energy, both for buildings and for power generation. Um, the, that's 69%, transportation emissions are about 29%, and then the smallest sector is waste and uh, water uh, together is less than 3%. Um, the other, uh, foundational data set was risk and vulnerability assessments. And we, we had some data in the region um, that CMAP had conducted for us, um, looking at flood susceptibility um, and vulnerable communities. This is a land surface temperature that was studied. Um, but we also had a community input. Um, Ned, do you wanna come off camera and talk about that for a minute? So there was another component to this besides the data. And you can say, no, I didn't. <laughs> we didn't practice this one. <laughs> well, I'm happy to jump in here. Um, we know that um, data are essential, but not sufficient for describing vulnerability and risk and people's perceptions of what kinds of challenges they face to climate related hazards are important um, because they reflect constituent concerns. If you're a politician, you have to respond to your constituency. But also, the lived experience of people 
incorporates all kinds of complexities about the urban environment, where people live, their housing conditions. Um, you might be experiencing flooding in a place where models and data wouldn't suggest would be uh, from a watershed hydrology perspective, particularly vulnerable. But if the infrastructure is aged or if you are under capacity due to um, non-stationarity in the precipitation record, then your lived experience needs to be incorporated. So what we did was um, demonstrated to the, um, the people participating in the plan how we can bring in social science data. We did surveys of people's perceptions of risk to uh, a number of climate-related hazards as well as climate stressors. So something that pops out is urban heat. People are very concerned about urban heat. Even though it's a pretty rare phenomenon, it's been very deadly for the city of Chicago um, in the past. And so despite its rarity, it's a big concern. And with climate change, um, that frequency will, will only increase of heat waves. So um, we incorporate that kind of survey information into our assessment of vulnerability and risk in, in a narrative way, and that therefore can be addressed through a number of the kinds of uh, strategies that Edith is going to dive into next, I believe. And I'll, I'll just add to what Ned said. The, um, the exercises that we did, there was a very different level of involvement uh, for people in the mitigation side and the adaptation side. Um, the mitigation side, we looked at our Greenest Region Compact framework and picked out some strategies and there was discussion. It was very traditional, um, but uh, Ned um, worked worked up a, a, a really engaging online process that allowed um, for this audience participation, for a stakeholder participation that I really think gave them some buy-in and some understanding. So I would say it was kind of fun too, those workshops. So next slide, please. And I just to put closure on that. Jennifer, if you want access to any of those online survey tools, we can certainly provide them for the Annex 9 community. Okay, so I said that, you know, this is a climate action plan for the region, and the region, the reason it's not a regional climate action plan is because this is focused on municipal action. This is the audience that we serve. This is the world that we know. Um, and so there are three primary levers, and we have to say one of the benefits of working in the cohorts um, was that we learned from each other. And so these uh, three levers were uh, were given to us with with uh, with love and permission from the Kansas City uh, Collaborative that we worked with. But the first primary lever for a municipality is leadership. Um, and a municipality's responsibility to take climate action and lead by doing. Next is the municipal responsibility to encourage others. And this is surprisingly powerful. So uh, encourage their constituents uh, to adopt behavior, behaviors both related to mitigation and adaptation, and then to encourage constituents, businesses, institutions, and other levels of government. So local governments can be powerful that way. And the final one is the one that is probably most obvious, which is enact policies and codes um, for climate action. And the whole plan is uh, tailored around this, the, these three levers. Next slide, please. And so I'll um, dig into a little bit of the mitigation objectives um, and then just give you a sample of how the strategies are arranged. So next slide. Um, and bef this, this is, uh, before I get into this, the strategies and objectives, um, looking at how we process the data, we had access to a, term, a tool that was called CURB, um, and this was provided to us through the Global Covenant of Mayors, uh, which we inputted the data that we had from the greenhouse gas inventory. And so this wedge really gives us the foundation for which we will make determinations about how to address the sources of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and you can see the colored wedges uh, represent areas that will then emerge as our uh, uh, objectives in climate mitigation. The largest wedge, which you can look at, it's actually the top three wedges, the periwinkle wedge, the green, and the um, orange are all related to building energy. Um, and so that's really where we have to spend, uh, spend our efforts. So this will also am animate. So Ned, if you wanna give it a, a tap, you'll see the baseline um, in 2015 is our greenhouse gas inventory. 
uh, that we have, and uh, we know we're at 119 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. Next slide. And then again, we've had a lot of people say, why do the emissions keep rising? This is called the, um, the do nothing scenario or business as usual. The modeling projects a rise in um, population over time. And next slide. Or excuse me, ne uh, next animation. Oh, there it is. Uh, so then the, the, the goal is to drive down those emissions um, by 2050. And just take a moment and look at the, the slide here. Um, th at the baseline would be net zero emissions, which is really where we'd love to get to. But through all of the modeling exercises that we did using the data that we had um, and the tool that we had, we were not able to demonstrate uh, achieving tw uh, net zero emissions by 2050. Um, and that green bar that you see at the bottom of the graph is where we need innovation. That's better data. That's you know future technologies, uh, it's carbon capture. Um, and so we, we use these carefully, the, the target um, and the goal uh, in the way we put the plan together. So next slide. And so the climate mitigation goal um, is really where we want to be, and that is net zero greenhouse gas emissions. But we set the science-based targets um, with interim targets over time. So next uh, tap, please. And the, the target, first target, 2030, is looking at a 2050, I mean, excuse me, a 50% reduction. We are, are using baseline 2005 levels uh, for, that, for that modeling. So through, uh, we're actually believing that the closure of a lot of our coal-fired power plants um, will give us the biggest savings and the shift in the energy policy over time. Looking at an interim uh, reduction of 65% by 2040, and then uh, knowing that there is a, a, a possible achievement of their at least 80% emissions reduction by 2050. Next slide. And so the mitigation objectives um, are to demonstrate leadership to reduce emissions. And these are actions that for which we cannot measure emissions reductions, but that are essential. Decarbonize energy sources, meaning clean up our power generation. Next. Optimize building energy, both energy efficiency and electrification. Implement clean energy policies, surprisingly powerful for local governments. Decarbonize transportation, meaning um, shifting away from internal combustion engines, reducing vehicle miles traveled, giving up on the uh, personal vehicle, or finding other methods of active transportation. You can see, uh, manage water and waste sustainably. Um, these are all uh, lumped together, but still important strategies. And then finally, is sustain ecosystems to sequester carbon. And then I'll go into a little bit of detail on one of these objectives, decarbonize transportation. Next slide. And so this is an example in our uh, climate action plan is an appendix um, for the mitigation strategies. And this is more detailed than we can present on the slide, but just to orient you a little bit, there are about 49-ish strategies um, in mitigation. And so to address decarbonizing transportation, one of the samples that you'll see there is to ad adapt development processes to accelerate investment in EV charging infrastructure. This is for municipalities, I say, to get out of the way of electric vehicle um, deployment and, and uh, adoption. And this would be policies like zone, supportive zoning codes. And if you see the municipal role column there, go ahead and animate. And so those columns to the right are decision support tools. Um, and those are like solution status is a risk factor. If it's an evolving or proven uh, strategy, those are the ones that are easiest, uh, less, less risky. Greenhouse gas um, potential reduction puts into words what, what our uh, wedges tell us. Um, and cost and effort required helps a municipality evaluate the feasibility of undertaking that particular strategy. And next. Just uh, one more animation. Each of the strategies then also, which we can't fit on the page here, but every strategy is analyzed for equity considerations. Uh, we identify potential partners for municipalities and then talk about outcomes and co-benefits or the intersection between mitigation and adaptation. Next slide. Over to you, Ned. 
this is my cue to jump in. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, everything that Edith just went through, I'm going to assume you now know, but <laughs> go ahead and put in the Q&A panel if you have any questions about these, um, all of these different columns, because at the heart of this plan is quite a lot of uh, research that Edith and her staff have conducted over a pretty substantial period of time. So um, I want to emphasize that what I'm observing in the adaptation and resilience building field is that there is a real thirst for having a database and accessing a database of potential actions to take and linking those to specific outcomes that you're seeking. So in this case, this table is focusing on uh, decarbonizing transportation within the um, context of greenhouse gas mitigation. My remit is to focus on adaptation and resilience. Um, what we hear is that people have a grasp conceptually and in terms of workflows of how to address greenhouse gas mitigation, but adaptation and resilience are trickier for or less familiar at this stage for municipal governments and people in positions of authority to address, which is that is really the raison d'etre for the uh, US Climate Resilience Toolkit. And so um, first off, we'll start with a conceptual definition of what we mean by building resilience in the context of this plan, but indeed in any engagement that the toolkit team conducts. If we think about present day, um, we know that increasing population, aging infrastructure, um, among many factors, have led to more and more um, impacts from climate-related hazards. And we'll just point out briefly that a um, a disaster, a natural disaster, is really just the confluence of a extreme natural event and human development in harm's way. So we have today a situation where both climate change influencing the frequency and intensity of events and human development in harm's way, maladaptation, are combining to create impacts that we don't want. So depicted here is a flooded car, lack of access to food, fuel, um, probably power um, uh, has been compromised in this extreme flood. And so that's a set of conditions that we can um, mitigate through planning and preparation when the sun is shining and it's less expensive to address. And so what we mean by resilience is upgrading our, our infrastructure, which could include culverts and bridges, uh, combined sewer overflow systems, separated sewer overflow systems, um, changing our fuel sources so we're not increasing the risk of climate-related hazards through more emissions of greenhouse gases. And so we are envisioning increasing the baseline um, level of service in a community over time to prevent the kinds of um, negative consequences of climate-related hazards where people live, work, play, et cetera. So we did set climate adaptation goals as well for persistent, equitable climate adaptation. That's essentially saying that we know, as Edith pointed out at the very beginning, that climate change will continue even if we shut off the tap tomorrow of greenhouse gas emissions the equilibrium concentration of uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and the added heat to the Earth's system will take quite a long time to, to come to equilibrium in terms of the influence on atmospheric and oceanic conditions. So we must commit to persistent adaptation with equity at the center. We, um, for, by 2030, it seems very reasonable that we could do the easy things, the, the gavel that uh, um, 
that Edith used in, in her icon of um, lead, encourage, and enact. You know, governance systems can evolve to incorporate climate smart thinking. And that means um, that NOAA and our partners working with government officials can bring climate information to where it's relevant and quickly update policies and um, actions and education. So I'm going to dive into some of those options in, in just a, another moment. But by 2040, what we're envisioning is that there's more cooperation at regional levels. So we already have in this nation, COGS and MPOs, regional organizations that are set up to disperse federal funds locally at a sub-state level. And through those organizations, we can also um, envision that there would be cooperation on stormwater management at a watershed basis or um, housing and transportation planning that considers demographics as they're evolving holistically. And um, that subject, incorporating equity, is clearly a frontier for our political and social systems where we're, we're learning about the multi-generational impacts of past generations' decisions around land use planning. And we have an opportunity to redress those problems and into the future. So by 2050, we can envision that communities are indeed working together internally and across communities to have a cohesive response to the impacts of climate change and climate variability. So the adaptation <clears throat> chapters in this plan focus on also a series of objectives, five objectives. The first one being education and engagement. Because what we see in every climate action plan around the world is that working with the constituency to not just bring awareness, but identify what people care about and address those. There's a two-way exchange of information among the people who have resources and responsibility and people who have either elected them or by proxy elected them if they're administrators for the county or city. Incorporating equity and inclusion is central to this plan. And um, as I mentioned just a moment ago, presents us with a incredibly important opportunity to redress the maladaptation that has been, that was enforced by policy in previous generations. Collaboration and building capacity um, is a process that evolves out of education and engagement whereby we are bringing relevant information forward and evolving new ways of doing emergency management, transportation planning, health provision in the context of understanding changing risk profiles. And enacting plans and policies, um, Edith already spoke to that, but it, that's an important strategy, set of strategies in mitigation and adaptation and adapting operations and investments for future conditions, uh, it really means updating our infrastructure and our operations and planning to, to reflect the non-stationarity in the climate system, the changes that have happened and that will continue to happen. So we took a further dive into specifying the ways that climate affects hazards and assets because climate isn't what kills people. It's the climate related hazards of extreme events, heat, flooding, and so forth that causes um, problems for people. And so looking at flooding in homes specifically as one potential impact is different than looking at flooding and transportation or stormwater and infrastructure. Similarly, heat and health. These, these require different ways of understanding frequency and intensity of climate-related events, as well as where people, places, things that we value are in harm's way. 
So in the plan, we've got six different potential climate related impacts moving down the list here further air quality flooding and public health deals with people's housing and if there's per persistent flooding in a home it can affect mold and um, insulation and sewage systems and so forth and that can affect people's uh, um, health directly through airborne um, irritants and finally, drought and water supply has been a long-term focus within the Chicago region, as well as uh, NOAA and its partners for a long time. And so um, will continue to be a concern for the region to address. I can't go into all these potential climate-related impacts, so I'll focus a little bit on stormwater and infrastructure. Um, again, taking a peek at the underlying data set that Edith has compiled, um, she already kind of went into descriptions of the columns out here to the right, so I'm not going to focus on that, but we've given for all the strategies in the adaptation section, we've indicated which climate related impacts these strategies relate to. So offline, I've gone ahead and sorted all the strategies and chosen the ones related to stormwater and infrastructure. So there's an X in this column, in other words. So for all of those, I can pull out just the ones focusing on that potential climate-related impact. And what we find when we do that, and I'm deliberately not showing the data in here um, in, the, in the middle of the table, but we've got strategies that fit into the five objectives, education and engagement, equity, um, collaboration, enacting plans and policies, and adapting operations. So um, by building this data set in a deliberate way, we can sort and provide strategies in a way that's targeted to the particular application that you have. And um, for stormwater and infrastructure, I mean, we came up with this um, not unmanageable list. Um, of potential strategies. So again, these, these come from adaptation plans from around the country and around the world, 52 different plans that Edith has researched. And so to some extent, these are tested strategies. The way they're implemented on the ground locally then requires further refinement and uh, planning, but we've given a big jump start to governments to get some insight into what to do. So the biggest question, again, that I hear from people wanting to get into adaptation is, so what kinds of things will we do? Well, Edith has made that pretty straightforward to answer through sorting this spreadsheet um, for engagement. You know, if you read through these, you'll see the alignment of these strategies to the objectives that we had, uh, that we have overall. Generally, the things at the bottom of this table cost a little bit more than the things at the top of the table. And so actually moving forward from a platform of engagement, equity, and collaboration will naturally lead to the kinds of investments, finance, and funding that are needed. And I'll, I'll mention that um, through other work that my office has been funding and involved in, we are publishing um, or, or promoting some guidance from the American Society of Adaptation Professionals about how to get funding and finance. Um, so we're we're very engaged in how do you actually implement strategies like this. Um, I think with that, Edith, I'll turn things back over to you to um, to talk about next steps and where things are going. Before Unless there are questions, and Jennifer, if there are, just chime in. Great, thank you both. That was outstanding. Oh, we're not done yet. <laughs> we're not quite done. <laughs> we're just doing a pause for questions. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely, sorry. Um, yes, um, so we do have a question in the question box and I would encourage anybody who has a question to go ahead and enter it in the question box on your right-hand dashboard. Um, so the question is actually for both our speakers. Can you describe the kinds of equity considerations and actions that are being integrated into the Climate Action Plan and some specific examples of actions. Uh, what impact do you anticipate for equity-deserving communities? 
Uh, I'll start off and Edith okay. can um, reflect more specifically on, on what's happening now. Um, and from my, from my point of view, equity shows up as an engagement process where we, we really need the involvement of community to guide uh, the relevant decision makers about what is valued, what's important, what's happening. So um, Edith invited uh, a mayor from a small community to participate in our um, workshop to speak to equity. And what we learned is that people's housing is giving is is increasing their vulnerability because of flooding leading to mold which leads to asthma and other respiratory diseases and problems so the way equity shows up from a climate lens is these hazards are exacerbating underlying long-term stressors in the community that we need to address perhaps through this collaboration and capacity building where the housing authority understands the the vulnerability and risk associated with flooding because they have direct access to the same hydrology information that the transportation folks have and the parks people have and as a result the housing um, housing priorities can be set around improving adaptive capacity and lowering sensitivity for populations so that's one example um, and i in my experience, you know, in Maslow's hierarchy, climate change isn't the highest concern for people who are um, uh, working paycheck to paycheck. And it's really the responsibility of the people in government to to bring forward information that's relevant, but work within the frame of mind that the citizens and the constituents have, which is addressing housing and food and education and so forth. Um, over to you, Edith. I'm sure you could. Yeah. Add. Um, just to, I wanted to follow up on what Ned was showing here on the adaptation strategies, and he said this is a not unmanageable list. Um, and you know, I want to kind of underscore that, but also answer the question about equity. So, um, if you, if you know, what does a, it, it, we struggle with. Uh, equity at a regional scale and a municipal scale because you know I represent our municipal our organization represents every environmental justice community in the Chicagoland area and for the mayors like the one that Ned was talking about you know serving their constituents um, that are mostly a vulnerable population is very different than addressing equity at a regional scale where communities have differences in, in the amount of resources and in, in their demographics um, but this, uh, so that the actions in this plan on the adaptation side, I have to point out one of my favorite ones, um, which is here. And if you follow the, you know, the purple um, box there that has incorporate equity and inclusion into climate adaptation efforts, just including vulnerable residents in planning and uh, uh, guiding investments. You know, having them as participants at the table is really an important strategy and important thing to drive um, municipalities to do. Um, Ned did a really good job in just addressing equity on the adaptation side, and I'll just use one example on the mitigation side, where there's a real opportunity for both reducing emissions and equitable outcomes, and I'll focus on energy efficiency. Um, we found that 26% of the, the, the stationary building emissions come from residential energy. Well, why not focus on, and, then, and I have to say that at our state level, we have state policies that are focusing on um, low income, lower housing stock, um, for investment in energy efficiency because that provides an improved um, living conditions, uh, improved building performance, and reduces energy burden. So I think this is where the plan, you know, just one example of how the plan integrates um, equitable responses and, and uh, climate outcomes. So going on to, and I'll, I'll wrap up here with the next steps for the climate action plan. One more slide, please. So um, the climate action plan is most everything the mayor's caucus uh, does works at two levels, where you know working locally and then regionally. So it, uh, supporting the municipalities that I serve locally, just after we launched the climate action plan, which was very successful, we started having municipalities saying, "That was awesome. Now what do we do?" So we offered an opportunity for a, a municipal resolution for municipalities to endorse the goals of the cap 
Um, and those goals, which just to re repeat, is uh, a, a res persistent, resilient uh, communities and uh, net zero. So these are the goals as well as the objectives and the interim targets. Those went before village boards and city councils. And in the you know few months that the, the Climate Action Plan has been out, we now have 33 municipalities, one county, and then our major water reclamation district that have in formally endorsed the goals of the CAP and more coming in all the time. Next. We've had a lot of inquiries about greenhouse gas inventories, and the, the initial plan was for um, our local, particularly smaller municipalities, to just move it, step right into action, jump over that um, a rather onerous task of having to conduct a greenhouse gas uh, inventory. Um, but for municipalities, they can use the regional data and make priorities that way, set their priorities for actions that way. Next. On the vulnerability assessment, risk and vulnerability assessment, if a municipality wants to take it to the next step, as Ned implied, was um, using steps to resilience. Ned, do you want to respond to that? <laughs> Just talk a little bit more about how um, that's the next step for municipalities. Sure, yes. Um, the steps to resilience framework is a risk assessment decision-making um, set of guidance that uh, our office is producing a, a guidebook on how to go through the steps to resilience. And we're hoping to see literally hundreds of plans uh, come out that um, are indeed fundable and have identified sources of funding. Um, so if people are interested in that, they can, they're welcome to reach out to me directly. And uh, my email address will be at the end of this presentation. One more tap there. Um, and mitigation strategies that this is using any of the strategies that the climate action plan is set up for municipalities to take those actions and run with it. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the greenest region compact next. Next slide, please. Oh, and the same with the uh, adaptation strategies. Sorry to, to jump over that, but uh, back to steps to resilience and using the adaptation strategies that, you know, Ned just demonstrated. Now the next slide. So on the regional level, um, we also use the Climate Action Plan, and, I, and I'll just point out three um, projects that we're already working on. So if you'll see on the left, the CAP objectives that we're addressing, and we have two projects um, that are underway and accelerated because of the Climate Action Plan. I mentioned um, optimizing building energy, particular focus on residential energy literacy with an aim to reduce um, energy burden, and we have some um, funding to mobilize municipalities in connecting their residents to existing resources from the utilities. Um, decarbonized transportation, we are launching a new program. I've got a my first committee meeting next week um, called EV Readiness, and this is to remove the policy barriers and to help accelerate investment in electric vehicle infrastructure. And the new one, which is kind of fun for me because um, this is the first time that I get, for in a while that I get to do a project that has nothing to do with kilowatts, and that is the reducing vehicle miles traveled. As a direct result of the Climate Action Plan, we were approached by the two leading planning and transportation, active transportation organizations in the region um, to really build on what the Climate Action Plan said about active transportation and access to uh, walking and transit. So that's a new project for us. Next slide, please. And then um, I'll just touch on this briefly because I know we're running out of time here. Um, Prior to the, to the CAP, we've had some gaps in the Greenest Region Compact. It's an incredibly useful tool. Um, and if you want to go back to the, you don't move on the slides now, but when I talked about the three parts of the slides are the Greenest Region Compact, we have a political pledge, a framework, and then we get busy doing things together. We don't have any methods um, for tracking and reporting. So most of this is hopeful, but the Climate Action Plan um, really drives us to develop these tools um, and then gives us more of a vision on how to get it done. Next slide, there we go. So the um, I, I, I jokingly say I've had a crush on Sustainable Jersey since I started at the Mayor's Caucus because this is a statewide collaborative of municipalities on sustainability. It's a statewide organization. It is bigger than ours. But they have this really robust uh, system for tracking and reporting um, metrics. And so at, they, they provide recognition to the municipalities. This is an interactive map. And then on the next slide, you can see that by engaging with the platform the Sustainable Jersey has, that anyone can uh, can hop in and look at 
what any community is doing related to objectives that they've already uh, committed to. Um, and this uh, both regional and local focus is what we're hoping to be able to achieve as the next step for the Greenest Region Compact, uh, building on the Climate Action Plan. Go ahead to the next slide. And uh, there, there is alignment, um, not, it's, it's not, 100% alignment, otherwise we wouldn't have a need for a climate action plan, but the Greenest Region Compact is focused on sensible sustainability strategies for municipalities. The CAP takes it to the next step and then really zeroes in on climate mitigation, adaptation, and equity with, uh, with targets and metrics. But there's alignment between the strategies. So if you look at the CAP strategy and the Greenest Region Compact, that's a, a snip there from our Greenest Region Compact framework on energy, we're really interested in codes and permitting practices because not only is that a good sustainability action, it turns out that's a sensible climate action as well. And so the next step for the for us at the Mayor's Caucus is to bring those two uh, tools together, the Greenest Region Compact, which has incredible political support and a lot of users, um, and the Climate Action Plan into a format that allows municipalities um, to move forward take these actions and then a uh, reporting and accountability system um, that, can, that can report on outcomes. I think that's the last slide we have. So with that, I will just close and say thank you so much to, uh, for having us. And uh, Ned and I are both open to questions. Great, thank you to both of you. That was really outstanding. Um, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and put them into the question box. Um, I am very um, interested. So Ned, is this as a full case study, not just the tools that were used, also on the resilient climate resilience toolkit as a case study? That's a great question. Oh my goodness, you've caught me out. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure, Jennifer. I'm gonna have to follow up on that. Um, but yes, in the toolkit, we do have a library of case studies that allow, um, you know, allow people to compare notes on what are the standard and tested practices um, so that you have something to measure against um, in your own resilience planning. Um, I will have to look into that, Jennifer, and see. When we pu publish case studies, we want to show the implementation. So something like the EV Ready program would be what would show up in the toolkit. So okay, um, no, that's great. I just wanted to highlight the toolkit in, in all of the the different kinds of um, assets and uh, resources that are there. I know I did it a little at the beginning, um, but I think some of the case studies are pretty powerful. And looking through the list of folks that we have online today, um, we uh, um, let me actually I can change this back over to Jocelyn real quick. Um, that um, that we have quite a few folks from uh, from municipalities, from state levels, from like regional council of government kind of organizations that I'm sure are really, really, um, and they've been in very engaged on this. Actually, we've had a couple of questions come in. Um, also from Janessa Doherty, um, it's often easier to get council and municipal buy-in to support solutions that are proven and require a low capital investment. This is often low hanging fruit. What strategies have you used to build the business case for ambitious climate adaptation mitigation work, including new technologies? Can you repeat the question? Because I got all excited about answering the question about low cost strategies. <laughs> so oh, yeah. to to, sounds like the challenging one is where I should uh, focus on. So just right, right. It says it's often easier to get a council and municipal buy-in to support solutions that are proven and require low capital investment. This is often low hanging fruit. But what strategies have you used to build the business case for ambitious climate adaptation or mitigation work? including new technologies. Okay, then um, I, think I, I think I can um, address that one. So if you take, for example, and there were lots of strategies, particularly related to uh, like building energy policies and such that are um, low to no cost. So let's talk about the EV readiness because that's an easy low hanging fruit and you're correct in, um, in calling that one out. But um, so municipalities take steps they become ready for EV investment. 
we are now part of a dialogue really as a direct result of the launch of the Climate Action Plan and the new partnerships that we fostered with um, a group called the, uh, the Civic Federation for Chicago, which is a like the Mayor's Caucus, which is made up of, of mayors, it's the CEOs of all the organizations, uh, CEOs of the major corporations in the Chicago area, really interested in creating um, an, uh, an EV hub, manufacturing and technology hub in Illinois. And uh, we also, I will just mention that we're, um, we're home to Argonne National Labs and Fermi, both of which have um, amazing uh, technological resources, scientific resources, and they've been collaborators and friends to the Mayor's Caucus. So they see value in collaborating with municipalities. So with Argonne National Labs, the corporations, they've been advocating for major investment for EV manufacturing, which is really beyond what any municipality can do. Um, but this, uh, we've, we've landed in Illinois two manufacturing facilities, three um, for electric vehicles. We have a new facility that's just opening up, and it's a Canadian firm, Lion Electric, uh, to build electric buses and electric trucks. We're now part of that dialogue. The fact that there's this um, a culture of readiness in communities uh, for EV adoption, they're actually seeing that as part of the attractiveness for the Illinois region to for this major investment in electric vehicle infrastructure technologies and advancement. So does that answer the question? Is that what you were looking for? I, I think so. Um, that was good. Thank you. Uh, and we have one more. Um, I know we're a little over. But out, Jennifer, that the, the database, the spreadsheet itself has an indication of costs oh. and so people can quickly scan. It does, and one more thing that I want to say about that. So, um, just in terms of the low-hanging fruit, um, if you look at the the climate action plan and look at that uh, decarbonize energy sources, it was a really awkward one for us for municipalities because really the the utilities have to um, take those actions, but we can drive that. What's the municipal role in driving? Um, cleaner energy generation is we can collaborate to purchase cleaner energy and drive markets for that. But we're, I would have to say we're collaborating with our utility on the EV readiness project. So I think within the municipal realm, you know, we're doing what we can to support uh, to support the partners beyond the municipal boundaries. Good. Okay. And this is another interesting one that I'm sure a lot of people are interested in. In inviting vulnerable populations to the table, do actors of the Climate Action Plan have any training or support for dealing with the change in language and communication that will happen in those meetings? I'll jump in there, Edith. Yeah. Um, we, um, I mentioned uh, briefly in passing almost that um, our office has funded a number of um, efforts to expand capacity for adaptation professionals to work uh, in the realm where you're being asked to work with a diverse set of populations or understanding funding and finance or how to use nature-based solutions um, and how to measure and track success over time. Those themes are things that the profession of adaptation um, services professionals has identified as gaps where we do need professional mm -hmm. development support. So we funded a, a project looking specifically at belonging, equity, justice, diversity, and inclusion, um, conceptually and in terms of skill sets, how to work with, um, with a diverse set of stakeholders in the planning process. So Antioch University, New England put together a, um, a synthesis paper on this, which will be hitting the streets very soon, I'm glad to say. Um, mm -hmm. We just finished uh, uh, that project on Monday, and we're just packaging up that report. But the question itself almost answers itself, which is, yes, we do need to um, have training and preparation to work um, with different constituencies and understand the historical context um, that their community brings when they come to the table and work to identify shared values across cultural, social, and socioeconomic 
boundaries that our society often reinforces in subtle ways. So the answer is yes, both to the fact that it's needed and that we have some resources. And I would welcome follow up about that. And I'll, hey. I'll add a little to that. So thank you, Ned, for leading, because I, uh, I was thinking about that one a little bit. But I'll, I'll speak to the inherent skills of local government in representing their constituents. So one of the advantages for working with a coalition of small communities, and if we look at the uh, the mayor of Broadview, which is a community of about 10,000, that was she was engaged in the uh, climate action plan process. And we had another uh, mayor representing a, a, a low income, uh, disadvantaged community, about 20,000. Is, is they're already engaged with their residents, right? So, uh, you know, at a local government level, they're incredibly accessible um, to village residents. And even during the pandemic, there's opportunities for um, engage for for residents to speak up we have a really unique uh resource at local government which is particularly um, popular and successful in the smaller communities called citizen commissions and a citizen commission literally is a, it's a statutory commission so the city council village board says we really need someone to work on aging issues on public health issues on uh veterans issues on sustainability issues on arts issues. And so they will commission, they'll ask for a group of residents to raise their hand and come forward and say, please help us with this. So a lot of the local plan, and those commissions are formally attached to, to the village board or the city council and providing engagement. And when, at the mayor's caucus, I always talk about working with the mayors, but we really work throughout the whole level. We have elected officials um, and they come from the community, right? So every mayor, every village trustee is a resident of those communities the staff um, and which are the professionals and then the citizen commissioners and all of them were very engaged in the process so it's not that much of a stretch uh, for us at the regional level to engage these diverse voices when they really represent their you know they're their representative of the leadership that's already engaged in the mayor's caucus so i hope that's helpful and that's not not weaseling out but that's how i see it we we're pretty close to our constituents and, and elected officials are really close to their constituents Great, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, well, we are past our time, but again, we're bleeding right into our regular quarterly Annex 9 uh, extended subcommittee call. Um, so um, I think with that, thank you both very, very much. You're more than welcome to stay on the call and listen to our Annex 9 uh, work that we're doing if you'd like. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that we will be sending out notes from this meeting. You'll be hearing from Jocelyn. And uh, we'll be sending out the slides and a recording of this webinar uh, for those who um, either were not able to be on today um, or if you would like to re-listen to some specific parts of this or the whole thing. Um, definitely some really great information. So thank you both Edith and uh, Ned. Thank you. You're very welcome. And we will be remaining engaged on the challenges <laughs> that we discuss, so I welcome any follow-up contact. Thank you, Jennifer. Yep, thank you.